What's up, everybody? Welcome to episode three of our YouTube series, Damn, That's Awesome. The show where we examine scenes from our favorite TV shows and movies that make you say, Damn! Damn! That's awesome! It's been a while since we made one of these videos, and last weekend I was thinking of ways to try and get back into this series, and I wrote down a bunch of ideas, but none of them really made me want to sit down and make this video. So instead I decided to sit down and pop in one of my favorite movies of all time, and just chill out. After the movie ended though, I immediately sat down and wrote this script, because I realized there really aren't a whole lot of YouTube videos about this movie. The movie we're going to be looking at in this video is the 2002 adaptation of Alexander Dumas's The Count of Monte Cristo. I've been a fan of this movie ever since it was first released, and it only gets better every time I watch it. Now I'm no movie critic, but I think the acting in this movie is top notch, and everything else about it makes it easy to rewatch multiple times. I do need to clarify though that this adaptation is the only version of the movie that I've seen and I haven't read the book, so I don't know how true it is to the source material or anything like that. If you're looking for an in-depth review about this movie, this ain't it. We are simply going to look at one of the most badass scenes in the movie, but before we do that, I need to provide a little bit of context. In case you don't know, there will be spoilers in this video, so if you haven't seen the movie, pause this video and go watch it. Seriously, watch it right now you will not be disappointed. The main character is Edmond Dantes. He is a young, naive French sailor played by Jesus. I mean, Jim Caviezel. He and his best friend, rich guy, Fernand Mondego, work together for a shipping company, and during their latest trip, their captain falls ill, forcing them to seek help on the island of Elba. Elba, if you don't know, is where Napoleon Bonaparte was exiled after he was removed from power in France. During their time on Elba, Napoleon asked to speak privately with Edmond. And during this conversation, he convinces him to carry a letter to an old friend back in Marseille. Napoleon makes him promise not to tell anyone about the letter, even Fernand, and since he's such a loyal dude, he agrees. This is where we first realize how naive Edmond truly is and it is the setup for his eventual downfall. You see, the whole time that Edmond was meeting with Napoleon, Fernand was spying on the interaction and saw Napoleon give him the letter. Being the spoiled little bitch that he is, Fernand was upset with Edmond for not telling him about the letter because he felt like he was keeping secrets from him. Once they finally land back in Marseille, Edmond is summoned to a meeting with the owner of the shipping company to report on the events of the trip. After a brief discussion, he is made captain of the ship because he risked his life in an attempt to save his captain. At this point in the movie, things are looking pretty good for old Edmond. He then runs off to tell his astonishingly hot girlfriend Mercedes the good news. Mercedes is stoked by this news because now Edmond will have enough money to get married, but Fernan is obviously jealous of Edmond's recent fortunes, despite the fact that he is much richer than Edmond could ever hope to be. Rather than congratulate his friend, Fernand runs off to wallow in his jealousy and get hammered, while Edmond and Mercedes have a little celebration of their own. This is where everything starts to go sideways for Edmond. Later that night, while having dinner with his family, Edmond is arrested on charges of treason and brought before the chief magistrate, Gerard Villefort, to answer for his crimes. Here, Edmund finds out that the letter Napoleon gave him was actually a schedule of beach patrols and instructions on how to help him escape Elba. Obviously flabbergasted by this revelation, Edmund protests that he is innocent, as he can't even read, so he had no idea what the letter contained. Villefort realizes that he is no traitor. He's just a dumb, naive sailor who was duped by the much smarter Napoleon. Story ends here, right? Wrong. Wrong. As Edmund is about to leave, Villefort asks him who was supposed to pick up the letter, to which Edmond responds, Monsieur Clarion. Villefort is obviously thrown off by this name, and he immediately burns the letter and offers Edmund a ride home in his carriage as a sort of apology. It was at this moment that he knew. He fucked up. The carriage is actually obviously a prison cart, showing once again how naive Edmund is as he just willingly gets into it. And at this point, they are clearly not planning on taking him home. 
The guards eventually reveal that they are taking him to the prison known as Chateau Deef, which if it's anything like it's portrayed in the movie, it is not a place that you'd want to get sent. Side note, this part of the movie is really well done. They do a really good job of showing Edmond slowly give in to the despair of his situation. He enters prison a religious and faithful man. God has everything to do with it. He's everywhere. He sees everything. And by the end of this sequence, he is bitter and resentful of God. There's no talk of God in here, priest. And it's easy to understand why, because we've seen what he's been through. Eventually, another prisoner breaks into Edmond's cell, as he was trying to tunnel his way towards the outer wall. This is initially pretty traumatic for Edmond, as you can imagine. He's been there alone for several years, and suddenly some old dude just busts up through the floor. I'd be freaking out too. The old man introduces himself as Abbe Faria, a former priest and scholar who has been in the Chateau d'If much longer than Edmond. After some initial introductions, the priest asks Edmond for his help in escaping by digging a tunnel in the opposite direction from the one he had been working on to this point. In return for his help, he promises to teach Edmond everything he knows, including how to fight and... To read and write? Of course. After a nice montage showing years of training and digging, the tunnel they are working on suddenly collapses and the priest is mortally wounded. Before he dies, he tells Edmond that he knows where the legendary treasure of Sparta is hidden and gives him a map that will help him find it. He urges him to keep digging so that he can escape. He also makes him promise to only use the money for good, which Edmond quickly denies. No, I will surely use it for my revenge. So at least he's honest. Edmond is then able to make his escape by putting the priest's dead body in his cell and taking his place in a body bag. He is then carried outside and thrown off the side of the island holding the prison, but not before grabbing the head guard Dorliac and taking him down with him. They land in the water and Dorliac knows it's about to be all over for him. I'm about to end this man's whole career. Edmund takes his revenge on Dorliac and then swims to a nearby island where he is finally free for about 45 seconds because it turns out that the island he swam to has a group of pirates on it. And this is where we meet one of my favorite characters in the movie, Jacopo. The pirate captain explains that Jacopo was caught hoarding gold instead of sharing it with the crew, so they came there to bury him alive. However, some of the crew ask for mercy, so he decides to let Jacopo fight for his life by facing Edmond in a knife fight. Edmond, having been training for years for something like this, quickly wins and convinces the captain to keep them both alive and on the crew. And from this point, Jacopo is sworn to Edmond forever. Fast forward a bit and eventually Edmond and Jacopo find the treasure of Sparta, making Edmond one of the richest people in the world. With his money secured, he can finally begin his plot to take down everyone that has wronged him. Another side note, when Edmond appears for the first time as the Count of Monte Cristo, that's a pretty badass scene as well. I mean, in terms of making an entrance, coming in on a hot air balloon with fireworks in the background, that's got to be in like the top five of all time. In the interest of not walking through the rest of the movie, let me skip ahead a bit by saying that Edmund's plan works perfectly. For some reason, no one recognizes the Count of Monte Cristo is Edmund Dantes, probably because he's not a naive little wimp anymore. But all of the people he's trying to get revenge on fall right into place exactly as he's planned, showing that his education under the priest was very well done. And finally, we come to the scene that made me want to make this video. The scene starts out with Villefort in the bathhouse, catching a nice steam as rich guys at the time tended to do. The Count enters, fully dressed, looking like a boss, and he begins what seems like an easygoing conversation among new business associates. Slowly, the Count begins to ask him questions about his past, mainly the situation surrounding Edmond Dantes. This obviously throws off Villefort because in his mind, no one even remembers Dantes, let alone this random Count that he just met. During the questioning, the Count continually turns up the steam, making Villefort increasingly more uncomfortable. As the conversation continues, Villefort, starting to freak out, finally asks the Count, I don't understand what this inquisition has to do with our business relationship. To which he responds, I'm about to tell you. At this point, 
We are treated to a series of flashbacks that fill in the backstory of the relationship between Mondego and Villefort. We discover that they had worked out a deal in which Mondego would kill Villefort's father, as removing his pro-Napoleon father would help Villefort move up in the government. In exchange, Villefort agrees to tell Mercedes that Edmund had been executed on charges of murder, allowing Mondego to swoop in and marry her, which was his main motivation for betraying Edmond in the first place. By now, Villefort is obviously shook. He hasn't realized that the Count is Edmund Dantes and can't understand how this man knows this information. After some more brilliant maneuvering by the Count, Villefort eventually confesses to his crimes right as the Count points out that there are police officers there listening to the whole conversation. This scene ends with Villefort being taken away in the same style of cart that he had put Edmund in all those years ago. As he gets in the cart, he sees a pistol and the police officer tells him that it's a courtesy for a gentleman. Giving him the easy out of committing suicide rather than face the consequences of his actions. He reluctantly picks up the pistol, puts it in his mouth, and pulls the trigger, only to find out that it wasn't loaded. The Count then gives us the best line in that scene. You didn't think I'd make it that easy, did you? Yeah. Damn, that's awesome. That final line is really what makes the entire scene so awesome. You didn't think I'd make it that easy, did you? Yeah. This perfectly sums up the idea behind his whole plan. Death is too good for them. They must suffer as I suffered. They must see their world, all they hold dear, ripped from them as it was ripped from me. Well, in this case, mission accomplished. The reason I love this scene so much is that Villefort was the person who put Edmond in Chateau Deef despite knowing that he was innocent of all the charges laid against him. No. It's you that's innocent. He took advantage of Edmond's naivety to protect his own ass and subjected him to years of mental and physical torture just to protect his reputation. Without Villefort, Fernand's plan to portray Edmond would have never worked and it's great to see Edmond finally exact his revenge. If you enjoyed this video, please hit that like button. Comment down below if you have any scenes from this movie that you would have picked other than the one that I picked. Also, be sure to subscribe so that you never miss an upload. Like I said, this is only episode 3 of this series, and I have a whole list of ideas for different videos to make, so we will be continuing this series down the line. Uh, but you can check the link in the description below for a playlist of the other episodes. Thanks for watching, and I'll catch you on the next video.